I think it was uh, less than an hour into this uh, symposium that I heard the word COVID. And I realized that um, it's something that we have become very familiar with. It's on the news every day. You read about it. We know the stats. Uh, we know what's happening, the different variants. And it's um, an area that has received a lot of attention in terms of research. It's been NIH uh, funding. There has been a number of academic medical centers that have been doing studies on COVID uh, in terms of trying to understand how it works and then the vaccination process. Um, we are lucky today to have two speakers that will talk about COVID use cases using I2B2. And um, we're going to start off with Griffin Weber, who will talk about uh, 4CE and then followed by Sean Murphy. So Griffin, the stage is yours. All right, thank you everyone, especially um, Diane for helping pull all this together and Zach for uh, uh, starting up I2B2. So 4C is the Consortium for Clinical Characterization of COVID-19 by EHR. Um, this was over two years ago now, beginning of the pandemic. Um, we were all uh, sort of shocked and trying to figure out what we wanted to do to see if we could address the problem. And we had this great I2B2 academic uh, users community as well as our Transmark colleagues. And um, Zach decided to send out an email and invite everybody to a Zoom meeting to figure out what we can do together. Um, that was in March 2020, and um, uh, we've been quite successful since then. We came together and we decided that what we were going to try to do was to engage local experts at each of our um, couple hundred institutions that were part of our organization. And there's three kinds of experts we thought we needed to address this problem. Informatics people, uh, a lot of what we are here, as well as statisticians and clinicians. We really want to understand what was going on with the patients, what were the doctors and nurses actually seeing, and it was just things that we could respond to that. So we engage these people at hospitals around the world to iteratively improve the data quality to gain trust in the data and to conduct rapid analyses on COVID-19. Early on, we didn't even know who these patients were. There weren't codes yet to identify patients with um, uh, COVID. So the, the codes were changing very rapidly. Um, we didn't know exactly how to, what data was good quality or poor quality. There were even a number of high profile publications that were coming out that ended up being retracted because they were, uh, either the methods or the data were problematic. So it was important to us to make sure that we understood what was going on in our data sets, that we understood the differences between uh, our colleagues here in the US as well as in other countries and to be able to do really fast analyses to make progress. Uh, we've grown over time up to over 300 hospitals in eight countries and four continents. Um, we always try to stay close to the data. Uh, we build all the time systems like Shrine and other tools that are really sophisticated methods of doing federated and um, other kinds of analyses. Here we're taking a little bit of a different approach. Um, we knew that it'd be too time consuming and costly and difficult to spin up a brand new network across multiple countries. But we could do something really simple, just send out some queries to different hospitals and ask them to take a quick look in your data. And what we're using here is a federated model where analyses are always run locally. You never share any patient level data back centrally to um, 4C. Um, by doing local analyses, we're able to engage the clinicians to figure out what are the high priority research questions. And then we can have a feedback loop where we're improving the data quality and gaining trust in the data. There's two kinds of analyses that we ask sites to do. We call them phase one and phase two. Phase one studies, the goal of those are to make very lightweight tasks from sites, um, easy IRB requests, simple technologies, um, but to gain a lot of, get a lot of hospitals to participate so we can gain a large perspective um, globally. We get different hospital perspective, regional and uh, country variation. We just ask people to do some simple SQL queries to run on your I2, B2, OMOP or other databases, um, leveraging uh, the ACT ontology. Um, and we can get some quick results back from this. 
Phase two, we take a deeper dive into the data. We take a subset of sites that we uh, that are interested in participating in a research question. We do chart review um, to validate our algorithms, and we can run more complex machine learning algorithms using R on Docker images that we sent to sites for a standardized compute environment. And then this feedback loop allows us to go from quick phase one studies at lots of institutions deep dives at a few institutions and get the results from that to improve our phase one results and um, continuing in that cycle. Um, this uh, process works very quickly. Our first uh, preprint was out in only four weeks after that initial Zoom call with Zach and the academic users group. Um, it did take several months to then go through peer review and eventually get published in Nature Digital Medicine. Um, but I think one of the sort of side effects of the pandemic was showing the importance of preprints, especially when there's public health crises and you need um, some quick, maybe not perfect, but quick um, uh, um, insights into what's going on. So as a phase one study, when we go into phase two, one of the things we found um, early on when we were trying to work with lots of hospitals, especially internationally, was that there are certain data elements that we really wanted, but we just knew were poor quality or inconsistent across hospitals. A lot of these were outcome measures such as ICU ventilation and death. Uh, we couldn't get those directly, so we came up with a set of proxy codes. We worked with our clinicians, and they came up with a set of things such as blood gases, certain medications that are used during intubation and procedures that would say if a patient had any of these things, um, it's more likely that they had severe COVID disease. So we were able to try this out in phase one studies and get some early insights into which patients were developing severe disease. And then in a phase two study, we actually were able to go back and do chart review and figure out how uh, well this algorithm worked. We found some differences between institutions, refined the algorithm. Um, this work Jeff Klon and others you know, led um, uh, to, to do this phase two study that helps us refine how we query for severe patients in our phase one analyses. Co uh, 4C has looked at different um, diseases and populations. We have uh, different working groups. Each working group develops R or SQL code that we then distribute out to sites. Uh, we've had an active pediatrics group that's um, done studies looking at 671 hospitalized children across 27 hospitals in six countries um, and other diseases such as neurological phenotypes. We also had a number of longitudinal studies. We've looked at the different COVID waves um, as well as long COVID and PASC. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about the, um, the results of that from Sean. One of the really important things that helped us out in launching 4C is the Shrine-based ACT network, um, which uh, will be a, a large session about that uh, tomorrow. The accrual of the Clinical Trials ACT network connects I2B2 systems at the 48 um, CTSA sites across the country. Together, it's over 100 million patients. Um, Shrine enables real-time queries of this network. So thousands of investigators can go onto their local Shrine uh, interface or ACT interface and be able to distribute queries out to all these sites and get an immediate count back. Um, 4C is, um, doesn't work like that. 4C, we're sending out queries and an informatics person has to run these queries on their database. We're able to get some early um, counts and basic understanding of what sites have through 4C. 4C uh, of th uh, through ACT, ACT also enabled us to access lots of I2B2 sites that were up to date with data that shared a common ontology um, with over a million concepts in it with COVID extensions. So it allowed us to do that rapid four week study because we had sites ready to go and we had ontologies that we could share with other institutions from other countries that were not part of this network. And then there's a feedback loop. The severity algorithm that we validated has been fed back into the ontology so that investigators querying ACT can use that. Some of the data insights that we gained through ACT, this is separate from the clinical insights, but what we learned about the data was that hospitals varied greatly in availability, coding, and quality of some of these key outcome measures, and this led to our use of proxies in our severity algorithm. Algorithms that we developed in spring of 2020 don't work now. They degraded in accuracy over time because of new treatments, vaccines, variants. We've had to continually improve these through our phase two studies, going back to our phase one and uh, having better algorithms. Lab tests are hard. Um, the, the different countries use different kinds of tests. 
even within the same hospital, there might be multiple machines that are reporting the same tests using different units. So this is a really significant challenge in trying to test by test harmonize the data across different institutions. We had a lot of hopes for doing race and ethnicity studies, uh, but what we learned very quickly was that other uh, countries view this in different ways. A lot of uh, countries, especially in Europe, do not collect race ethnicity data for privacy region reasons. And then different countries categorize race, race and ethnicity different ways. And even the US, where there's NIH standards for this, within the hospitals, they use local codes that then have to be mapped to the NIH standards, and some accuracy is lost in that process. We summarize a lot of the data insights that we gained from 4C in this um, paper titled What Every Reader Should Know About Studies Using Electronic Health Record Data But May Be Afraid to Ask. So what this is is when you're reading one of these uh, um, papers that use electronic health record data to study COVID or any other disease, you should be thinking about a number of things while you're reading that. Did they deal with the harmonization uh, problems of crossing different hospitals? Did they consider uh, data quality and missing data and how did they handle that? It's important to be able to trust the findings uh, from studies that leverage these kinds of data. Uh, we've had a number of publications I didn't get to talk about today from 4C. Um, the older ones have had time to accumulate some citations. This first one is in our top 3% of um, COVID publications that are out there. Um, even if it hasn't had time to get cited yet, you know, it very rapidly gets picked up in social media, and there's some specific papers we've had that have had some very high um, altmetric scores, um, early papers related to PASC and um, uh, hospitalizations for COVID. So next steps, where are we going with this? Um, we have working groups that come up with different research questions, and this guides a lot of the technology that we implement for uh, our distributing our queries. Um, the research questions that we're focused on now fall into three different categories. Um, one is where the you know, COVID status and a lot of additional information about the COVID disease is important for those research questions. And a challenge with this is increasing ascertainment uncertainty and complex dynamics of the disease. It's just getting harder and harder to trust the electronic health record data and know what's really going on with the patient. When you see a COVID positive test in an electronic health record today, you don't know how many times the patient has had COVID. You may not know if they've had vaccines or not. It's just very difficult to do this. There are special cases, though, where you can have better trust in the data. For example, whenever patients go in for surgery, they get a COVID test. So you know their status on a particular date and can follow their outcomes. Um, we're looking at small pivots to related diseases uh, where you don't have to know as much information about the COVID disease, just that they had COVID. Um, for example, we're interested in looking at obesity and age. Um, both increase the risk of severe COVID, but it's not clear which is more important at different ages. And how does this vary by subgroups, like just patients with diabetes? Um, so you can look at uh, patients today who've had COVID and then look for the pandemic to see what were the outcomes of patients um, back then before they were infected. And then there are questions that we have that have nothing to do with COVID, but just societal changes that occurred during the pandemic and how hospitals changed in treating patients. So for example, we can compare some disease in before 2020 to uh, how that disease is treated today. Uh, we've had a, a working group within 4C that has been studying psychiatric conditions in children. Um, here we're looking at things like school closings and other factors that affect children where we don't have to really know whether or not the children had COVID. It's more about other things that have changed that have affected their health. Um, cancer is another good example of this. Uh, mental stress, less enrollment in trials, and less screening all um, you know, has had a, an influence on cancer that we're interested in studying. Um, so our call at the bottom of this is help us refine these research questions. And if you're interested in um, participating in our next round of federated analyses, thank you. I want to do, let's see if there's a, a question or two maybe before we switch to Sean. Yeah, we got a couple of minutes. Yes. Correct, yeah, yeah. Yes. We'll switch to Sean, and uh, after you hear Sean, if we have more COVID questions later, we have plenty of break time for chat. Thank you.